Numbers, uh, chapters 22 to 24 is where we're going to be. We all, we all know that Christ was born um, outside of a really nice uh, inn, hotel as it were, uh, in a stable. Uh, and where he was born, it was probably noisy. Uh, if you know anything about stables, it was probably smelly. Uh, and a lot of animals were in there. The magnitude of his birth is amazing because uh, the Lord of glory, who created all things, according to Paul in uh, Colossians 1, 16 and 17, uh, created all things by the word of his mouth, um, left the glory of heaven uh, to be born in a stable, as it were, not in a fancy palace. And this fulfills uh, what the prophet uh, Isaiah said concerning the Messiah. When you read through the, the book of Isaiah, you run into the motif of the suffering servant uh, in chapters 41 and 42 and 53. Uh, and the suffering servant would be the Christ, the, the Messiah, the coming one. Uh, and when you see him being born in a stable, you can see that humility and that suffering started right from his birth. That's where he was. Amazing. When you look at his uh, particular birth from a theological prophetic perspective, um, there's much to learn as you go through the prophets like Isaiah uh, and other, other great prophets like Zechariah. Uh, but we could go to many of those texts, and I've done Christmas sermons for 30 years, but I always like to do something that, that's new at Christmas. Uh, and so as I prayed about it and thought about it, I began to ask myself the question, well, what about the animals? You don't read a lot about them in the prophets. Uh, the animals of Christmas. Uh, and then I went through the book of Matthew and, and Luke and read the, the accounts of Christ's birth, uh, and I don't see the animals. Try to find them. It's like they're invisible. Don't you know they were there? Because where was he born? Stable. What's in stables? Animals. Uh, and what is a manger anyway? It's a feed trough. If you're from the Midwest, you totally know what this is. It's a feed trough. And in their particular day and age, it wasn't the wooden Western concept of a, of a manger, which you see. Because uh, I've seen them, if you go with me to Israel, when we go again, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stone structure about that tall, uh, and it probably weighs a ton, uh, and it's got a, a, a trough cut out of it, chiseled out of it, that's several inches deep. Uh, and that's what they would pour the grain and the things in for the animals. That's what they ate out of. That's what Christ was born in. Talk about a humble beginning. But when you look through the, the accounts of the birth of Christ, uh, you don't see animals, really. Zip. Nada. Nix. Pick your language. You don't find them there. Well, what animals do you think were there? Because we all agree they were there, right? And if you were going to do a sermon series, which would you pick? Cattle, sheep, donkey. What else? Well, of course, if the donkey are cheating, you can see what I'm going to talk about. Um, I mean, like, I'm, I'm thinking about this. It's like, I, I, I want to talk about the animals uh, because I really do believe from what Scripture tells us they were there. So once you pick your animals, and I'm going to tell you which ones I'm going to pick. Starting the day, we're going to look at the donkey. Then we're going to, then we're going to, um, we're going to look at a goat. What in the world can you do with that for Christmas? A whole lot. Um, we're going to look at a camel. Again, try to find passages to tie into the Christmas story that validate this, because we're a Bible teaching church. And then on Christmas, uh, for Christmas, which falls on, um, you know, it's on Sunday this year, we're going to look at a lamb, because of course a little lamb would be there. Uh, so we're going to look at those four things. What are they? Donkey, goat, camel, and, and a lamb. And we're going to dig into those things. And uh, to dig into the concept of a, of a donkey, because uh, most assuredly uh, there was a donkey, and from uh, the distance between Jerusalem uh, and uh, Bethlehem, not far, a few miles, you can go on a ridge near uh, Jerusalem and see Bethlehem off in the distance. It's very quaint. It's just right there. Uh, don't you know that Mary was riding on one of these? It's their version of transportation back in the day. What, what do we learn from a donkey? Uh, well, you've got to go back, in my estimation, you need to go back to the Old Testament, Numbers 22 to 24, where we run into a really famous donkey. Uh, and you probably know this passage. I know it well, but it's one we must study and, and learn from it and then apply it to Christ. There's plenty to learn from a donkey, uh, theologically speaking, and that's what we want to do. Now, there's uh, 22, 23, and 24, the chapters we want to look at. But since um, I usually analyze things like the minutia, we would be here all afternoon. So we're going to uh, look at these passages and, and uh, zero in a little bit and then back up and then zero in again, different spots uh, to study this concept of Balaam the prophet and his donkey is going to point to Jesus, the true prophet, and his donkey. We want to look at that. Before we do that, I'm going to do a little background study because I'm not going to assume that uh, you're very uh, 
astute uh, in the Torah and the book of Numbers and its theological placement at this part of history. Uh, maybe you're a little rusty. You haven't read it in quite a while. So we want to make sure you totally understand what Numbers 22 is really all about, theologically speaking. So just to get you into the Torah, the book of Numbers in the Torah, we want to go back to Genesis where the Bible starts to, to kind of pick up what is God doing as we get to ch Numbers chapter 22. So for a few minutes, we're just going to review, right? Mm -hmm. Men fell in the Garden of Eden, right? Did he not? I told you we were going to review. We're going way back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Garden of Eden, men fell, and Jesus then uh, is prophesied in Genesis 3.15, first prophecy of the Old Testament, that one day the seed is going to come. The seed, the Messiah, the anointed one. What's he going to do? Well, he's first going to be uh, uh, afflicted by the devil on his heel, but it's prophesied he will come and deal a head blow, death blow to the devil in his system, destroy him. Well, that sets up the motif for the kingdom to come. That's Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 25, God says, not only am I going to send the seed one day, the Messiah, but I'm going to narrow it down to the line of Seth. He's going to come through that line. And then when you get to Genesis 12, God's going to call... Uh, a man out of like modern day Iraq from the Babylonian area, Mesopotamia. Uh, his name is Abraham and he's going to call him from Ur of the Chaldees. He's going to tell him, I want to make you a great nation. You're going to be the father of a great nation. I'm going to cut a covenant with you in Genesis 12 and I'm going to bring the seed through you. You're going to be the head patriarch of the Israelite nation and I'm going to bless you. And anybody that blesses you, I'm going to bless. And anybody that curses you, I'm going to curse them. But I'm going to make your seed as the sands and of, this, of the sea and, and as the stars of the heaven. You're going to be a mighty nation. But the seed will come through you. And you will have a land that you will rule and reign over as a people. That's the Abrahamic covenant. Unconditional, as it were. Chapter 49. We're reviewing, remember? Chapter 49 of the book of Genesis, verses 8 to 12. God says, not only am I going to come and bring this, this seed uh, through the line of Seth and, and through the, the people of Israel, but I'm going to narrow it down to a tribe. It's test time. Which tribe? Judah. Uh, Genesis 49 says the tribe of Judah is going to be the kingly tribe. The seed will come through that particular tribe. Uh, tribe in Israel. In Exodus chapters 1 to 11, we find out that the Israelites eventually became a tribe of uh, 12, uh, 12 people groups, making up the 12 tribes of Israel. They wound up in captivity in, in Exodus for uh, in Aero, uh, Pharaoh's Egypt for 400 something years. Chapters 1 through 11, God delivers them through an old man named Moses. He delivers them. They wind up out at Sinai, uh, and we read in, uh, at Sinai, Mount Sinai, we read uh, in Exodus 12 to 40, uh, God's going to give them the law to tell them how to be his people, how to, how to please him, uh, and he's going to form them into a people based on the law in Exodus 12 to 40, and then he's going to give them specific dis dimensions of how to build the tabernacle to worship him. He says, if you want to worship me, my people through whom the seed will come, you worship me in the tabernacle. Well, then when you get to the book of Leviticus, he tells you how to approach him, and it matters greatly how you approach him. You must come with blood sacrifice. His terms, not yours. No creativity. Come on my terms. That's the book of Leviticus. God saying, you're my people. The seed's coming through you. I've made you into a people, and I want you to worship me, but first you're sinful. To come before me, you need blood sacrifice. When you get to the book of Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers is the next one. Remember that? Numbers is the next one. In Numbers 1 through 20, we find out that they sent out 12 spies when they got to the land of promise that God promised Abraham. And they sent out to 12 spies and 10 came back and said, no way, can't take it. Two said, Joshua and Caleb, oh, we can totally do it. So glasses half empty, glasses half full, which one are you? Two men said, we can totally do it. What happened to the other people who sided, the majority sided with the two spies who said, we can't do it, we can't take the land of promise? All those people died in the wilderness over the next 40 years. They didn't believe God. They didn't trust God. They all, it says in the book of uh, Hebrews, their carcasses dropped in the desert. Unbelievable. And then they were replaced by their children. And their children learned the lesson. When God says do something, trust them, do it. So when you get to Numbers chapter 20, remember we're talking about Numbers 20? What in the world is that about? Well, if you read Numbers 20 and forward, uh, 20, 21, etc., you're going to find that as they begin to march toward the promised land, and they're going to swing uh, south around the Dead Sea and into the, the country of Moab, which is modern-day Jordan, and they're going to attack from the east across the Jordan River. Uh, when you read that, all their enemies begin to fall like dominoes. I mean, 
And they're a ragtag group of slaves. They're not trained in warfare. They don't have great military equipment. And God's going before them, helping them defeat their enemies. And then now all of a sudden, you're a king of Moab. And you see your enemy approaching. And no one's been able to stop this ragtag group of slaves. And you need some backup. You need some kind of major weapon to take them out. Something unconventional. What's he do, the king of Moab? His name's uh, Balak. What's he do? He gets a really good idea. He says, I, I think I'm going to hire the, 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 the best wizard in the world, the best soothsayer money can buy to put a curse on these people. And if he taps into the demonic realm, he can put one of those black magic curses on them and he'll curse the Israelites and the gods will take them out. Who does he hire? A guy named Balaam. What did God said? These are my people. I'm going to bless them. What's King Balak say? Now nah, I want them cursed. So what's he do? He, he, he sets out to find the ultimate unconventional weapon. Uh, the unconventional weapon is the, the, is the Gentile false prophet named Balaam. Uh, Balaam's name in Hebrew means, this is not positive. His name means, you got to question his parents, devourer. <laughs> Go figure. That's what his name is. Uh, his... Uh, He's going to live to fulfill that name because he's going to become known in biblical history, read the New Testament, as the quintessential false prophet hiding among the people of God. It's amazing. Uh, his nationality, Gentile. His city, uh, Beor. Uh, where's Beor? Uh, Beor is in Mesopotamia. Where's Mesopotamia? Don't you love history? Geography. Where's Mesopotamia? Kind of modern day Iraq area, Babylon, etc. Remember we've been in the book of Daniel. Where does it take place? You've forgotten already? Same area. Coincidental? I think not. Uh, park that in your brain for a moment. We'll come back to that later. Uh, this is who he hires. He hires the Beth soothsayer from the same region Daniel will be head of the soothsayer class 800 years later. Amazing. Interesting. Well, what happens when the, he hires the soothsayer, Balaam? Well, that's what we want to talk about. We're going to look at two things, what we learn from a donkey. Number one, we're going to look at the literal structure of the story, how it develops from a, as a literary piece. And then we're going to circle back around, and we're going to look at the spiritual aspects of that story. Okay? Let's look at the literal structure of the story about this ultimate wizard weapon against the people of God as they're camped out in the plains of Moab, and the king's wanting to know, how do, how do I stop these Jews? I'll curse them. Well, we want to first look at the road of the prophet Balaam. Verse 22. So, but God was angry because he, that prophet, was going. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. Now, he was riding on his, you have your Bible open, I'm assuming. He's riding on his, not a beamer, donkey, donkey. It's the equivalent of a beamer back in that day. Uh, not quite as fast. Uh, and he, he had his two servants with him because he's important. Remember, he's the head wizard. Uh, and when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand, the donkey uh, turned from off of the way and he went out into a field. I'm getting out of here. I, 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 added, that, I added that to the Bible. Okay. But Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back into the way. He's got like a stick or something. And then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path in the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. And when the donkey saw the, the angel of the Lord, uh, this time she pressed herself to the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. She crushed his foot. That was probably not comfortable. The angel of the Lord then went further uh, and stood in a narrow place because Balaam kept trying to get where he wanted to go to get his money. He's going to get paid for cursing Israel. Uh, he wants his money and this he, donkey keeps keeping him from getting there. And so the, he stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn to the right or the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, again, this time, what's the, what's the donkey do? She just lays down. Wouldn't you if you're the donkey? She just lays down under Balaam. So ba ba Balaam was angry and he struck the donkey with a stick the third time. He needs some anger management classes, <laughs> does he not? Now, this is a very interesting story. Now, if you, you're looking at the Bible, maybe you haven't been to church in a long time, maybe you've never been to church, and your presupposition is, the Bible's so dry and boring. I just am so bored when I read it. Are you kidding me? How could this be boring? This is ironic. This is humorous. This is amazing. This is an unbelievable story. What happens in this story? Well, the, the, the prophet for hire, he's all worried about his money, going to curse Israel. He's not a Christian. He's not a God-fearing person. He taps into the gods, the demons in the world at that day and time. Uh, and all of a sudden, as Balaam's going to get his money, uh, the, the donkey that he typically rides on constantly won't, won't go. 
what's, what's the donkey see? You know the story? He sees the angel of the Lord. You know, if you saw the angel of the Lord with a giant sword in his hand, positive, negative. <laughs> positive or negative? Probably negative for you. If you see God, he's got a sword, probably negative. Judgment. The donkey sees this. Now, he sees the angel of the Lord. Not, it's not indefinite, an angel of the Lord. He sees the. That article is most, many different ways you can classify that in Hebrew. You can classify it the monadic use of the article, meaning monadic. One and only, like the, the moon. There's just one of those. You can classify it the par excellence use of the article. Oh, there's nothing like this. It's the one. I mean, nothing better. It's the angel of the Lord. Who's that? I mean, who is that? Well, uh, it says it's an angel. It's not an ordinary angel. Really? Let me give you nine reasons why it's not an ordinary angel. You like detail, right? I do. Uh, Nine reasons why this is not an ordinary angel. Nine reasons why this is God. Nine reasons why this is not just God the Father. No, this is God the Son. Nine reasons why this is Christ who's appearing to a donkey. Oh, now it begins to take on a whole new meaning. Let's analyze this. Number, what, the angel of the Lord. Number one, his title is one reserved specifically for God. He's called the angel of Yahweh, the, uh, the eternal God, the holy name. Number two, he speaks as God to Hagar. He speaks as God to Moses from a burning bush. He's, he's the angel in the bush, but he's also said he's God in the bush. Amazing. Uh, he speaks to Manoah as God, uh, the father of Samson in Judges 13. Three, he intercedes for God in the book of Zechariah, chapter one, verse nine, because he's God. Uh, Number four, he's called Jehovah in the book of Zechariah, uh, chapter uh, uh, three, verses one and two. He's called Jehovah. One sense, he's called the angel of the Lord, and then they'll turn around and around and they'll call him the Lord. Amazing. You can connect the dots, can you not? Number five. Uh, He has the same role as Christ as the revealer of God. That's what Jesus does. He reveals God to us. Just read John chapter one, uh, uh, where it says Christ is the exegesis of God the Father. He shows us the Father. Well, that's the same thing that that the angel does uh, when he runs into Moses in the burning bush. Uh, Another thing, uh, he commissions God's people uh, as he commissioned Moses in the burning bush, and he commissioned you when you trust him as Savior. Remember his Final words, Jesus' final words, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Behold, you know, I, I commission you to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. He commissions. It's the same thing. And number seven, he brings deliverance. Uh, that's what the angel does in the Old Testament. That's what he does in the New Testament. Jesus brings deliverance. He offers protection to God's people, as he does in 2 Kings 19, as he does in Hebrews 13. And then nine, he intercedes. How do we know it's Christ. Well, number one, he's called God. So we know it's the angel's God. He's divine. And we know there's a trinity. Uh, And so this is the physical representation of Christ. He's the physical representation of God the Father, the trinity. He's the flesh and blood example in the Old Testament. And then when you get to the New Testament, you never run into the name again, the angel of the Lord. Why? He's born. He's born. He's now the God man. He's on the planet. You never run into that title again, ever, because he's here. Who did, who did the donkey see? Well, it was just an angel. No, not just an angel. He saw Christ. Don't you know that if there was an angel, a donkey seeing Christ in the Old Testament, kind of stands to reason, it's kind of ironically poetic, that later in 5 BC when the Christ is born, there'd be another donkey there to go, oh yeah, my family line has totally been into this. <laughs> now, <laughs> I mean, think about it. Now, now, the, the donkey, uh, three things happen, okay? The prophet's trying to get to his place to curse Israel down below in the plains, uh, and he wants his money. He's all about the money. Uh, the, but the donkey blocks his way three times because the donkey can see what's, what or who is standing in the way. And so the first time the donkey uh, heads off in some unknown direction. Have you ever ridden a donkey? I would not suggest doing it, especially in a foreign country where they've trained them based on certain words. I did this in Israel one time. I'll never do it again. I went to the Arbel Cliffs. They're the cliffs that are over the Sea of Galilee. They drop straight down, thousands of feet, down to the the Capernaum and the the floor down below where the Sea of Galilee is. And it's an amazing place to go and see the Golan Heights and and 
everything. I rode donkeys up there the first time. Never do that because they trained them based on Hebrew. They told us, this word means go, this word means stop. I didn't learn these in ancient Hebrew. I, I didn't know modern Hebrew for go or stop. So our whole tour group gets on these donkeys and we're riding up there and the donkeys are going off their own directions. And me and my friend Rick, the captain of homicide, he's like a 300 pound weightlifter. I can't even see his donkey, he dwarfs his donkey. And we're <laughs> going up this hillside, we're like, we wanna be first. And the donkey keeps going off the trail and everything and we get right up near the top where it drops off. And I'm like, hey Rick, man, hey, yeah, what? Do you, do you know what the word is for stop? No. <laughs> do you know what the word is for go? I don't know. Did, did they say he is go and who is stop? I, I don't, is it the reverse? I don't know. We made the logical decision. Step off the donkey. <laughs> tie the donkey off. And we walked the rest of the way up. And then we looked down below and we took pictures of our tour group all over the Galilean hillsides. We, we may never see them again. What do donkeys do? Their own thing. Now this donkey is not known for doing his own thing because this prophet has ridden this donkey many times before as we, as we understand from the context. So three times he tries to stop the rider because of what he sees. This is very interesting. I find this very ironically funny. Very interesting. In what way? Well, Balaam, who's the professional wizard, the professional soothsayer, who should have been able to see something in the dimension of the gods, can't see. Zero. But the ironic thing is, the donkey can. <laughs> the donkey can. And you're sitting there thinking, yeah, I knew my dog was totally smart. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about dogs. I'm talking about donkey, okay? He, he, all of a sudden, he, he can see. And this is a, something to think about as a side note. Sometimes people who say they can see spiritually are blind. Because remember, Jesus on another day, going to ride another donkey into town to proclaim himself Messiah. And those who claim they can see, the Pharisees, are the most blind in the nation. You must stop and ask yourself, that me? Do I say I can see, but I cannot? Back to my sermon. The revelation. That's the road. Very hard road. The revelation. Well, that, it says in verse 28, God's going to give a revelation to the prophet. And, and just stop. Sometimes God gives you, who think you can see, revelation that's off the grid that you have to stop and look at and go, whoa, that was weird. I mean, what, what, is, what does that mean? That statistically could not have happened. I mean, how did that happen? I ran into so-and-so. I mean, I'm in an airport 2,000 miles away from home, and I ran into that Christian I knew in college. I mean, how did that happen? God makes something weird happen to get your attention. This is off the charts weird. 28. The Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam. Notice the conversation. It's, the donkey knows Hebrew, by the way. I'm just saying. Okay. <laughs> what have I done to you that you struck me three times? Huh? And then Balaam, this is even funnier, said to the donkey, he's talking to the donkey. He said to the donkey, there's nothing in here that he stopped and said to himself, my donkey is talking, okay? He said to the donkey, because you have made a mockery of me, exclamation point. If there had been a sword in my hand, I would have killed you by now. And the donkey said to him, said to Balaam, must have been a Jewish donkey. They're arguing amongst themselves. Am I not your donkey on which you've ridden all of your life to this day? What's the answer to the rhetorical question? Yeah, I've been with you for years. I'm an awesome donkey. We, wherever you want to go, I take you there. Have I ever been accustomed to, to do so to you? Have I ever done this to you? Have I ever laid down on the job? Are you with me? Have I ever written? No. Have I ever crushed your foot in the side of a wall? No. Have I ever walked off in the middle of a field when you wanted to go that way? I, no, no, no. You can count on me. So the fact that I'm doing this to you, I'm trying to send you a message. He's having an argument with a donkey. <laughs> I mean, think about this. Now, now, now this, is, this is the passage. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm an intellectual. I got degrees after my name. I'm a thinking person. I'm a logical person. This is why I don't like the Bible. Talking animals, no way. This is impossible. I, as a thinking person, don't have a problem with this because of one little statement. It says the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey. Do you hear me? I believe in a living God. The living God wants to make a donkey speak. He could totally do it. Now, would it freak you out? <laughs> yeah, 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 it'd freak you out. But God could do that. I'll break it down this way. Uh, if God can talk out of the middle of a burning bush and it doesn't burn the bush, well, he, he can control fire. He can control a donkey. Now, number two, 
Uh, if he can part water on two occasions, like the Red Sea and the Jordan River at flood tide, if he can part water and instantly the ground's dry, he didn't part the water and say, wait my people for two months for the water to dry and then you can cross the Red Sea. No, parted, dry. If he can do that, he can make a donkey speak. Um, if he can take a pulsating pillar of fire and make it follow his people all throughout the Sinai Desert region for 40 years, every night at clockwork, poof, there it is, light for the evening. What happens in the morning? Cloud bank follows us wherever we go, the cloud bank. I'm from the desert. Clouds are wonderful. If one's following you for 40 years, what are you going to be saying? Isn't God good? So I would say if God can control the pillar of fire, control a bush on fire, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, donkey talking? What would you say? Piece of cake. I mean, it's not a problem. It's an amazing. Sometimes God gives you the most amazing evidence to see him. You're just not paying attention. Amazing evidence. Just stop and ask yourself. If I'm the so-called wizard in my field, but I don't really know God, I claim to know the gods, be what they may, but I don't really know the living God. I mean, what has God put across your path recently to wake you up that you blew by? See, that's the story. It's a donkey. Verse 31, the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. Whoa, don't you know he was shocked? <laughs> uh, he, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in his way with a sword drawn in his hand. What'd he do? He hit the ground. He hit the ground. Wouldn't you? You know, talk about a worldview shift. You know, well, I, you know, I believe in God. It's a closed cosmos. He's outside. He's not, no part of it, you know. And I mean, he's there, but I don't, you know, I don't really know him. And, uh, and uh, boom, he's there. Change his worldview. There is God standing right there. It says in verse 32, the angel of the Lord said to him, why have you struck your donkey these three times? You don't want God asking you questions. I'm just saying. Behold, and you're thinking about what you did with your dog last night, right? Okay? Okay, you gotta love him. Uh, behold, I've come out to you as an adversary because your way has been contrary to me. Uh, but the donkey saw me and he turned aside uh, from me these three times. If she had not turned from aside from me, I would have killed you. You should be thanking your lucky stars that she did what she did. Instead of thumping her, you should have been thanking her. She saved your life. I was going to take you out. You were going to curse my people. I said, they're blessed. Verse 34, Balaam said to the angel, I've sinned. For I did not know you were standing in the way against me. No kidding. And that sounds so confessional. Was it true? No. Because he's going to go out three more times and try to pronounce curse oracles on Israel. This is all fake confession. Because then he says, now then, if it is displeasing to you, oh, I'll turn back. God had told him in chapter 22, do not curse Israel. Do not. What's he do? He's going to curse them. And then he has the audacity to tell God in his presence, well, you know, if this curse thing is a, is a problem for you, I could totally not do it. I mean, when you get before the judgment throne of God, you don't want to be arguing like this. It, you know what I mean? This is lame. Yes, it was displeasing to God. He said, don't do that. And you were going to do that. That's how we know it's a false confession. How is God trying to grab your attention with reasonable evidences to come to him? Well, here he tried a donkey. Soothsayer wasn't listening. Verse 35, but the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the man, but you shall speak my word only that I'll tell you. So Balaam went along to the leaders unto Balak, who's the king of Moab. He goes there. Now we want to look at the reality. They get to this prophetic word. He finally gets to a location to utter uh, an oracle uh, over the uh, Israelites. And he, this, is, this is his first time. He's thinking, if I can just somehow work a curse in there, I get my money and it's good. The only problem is he's going to try this four times. And every time he opens his mouth, out comes the most wonderful statement regarding Israelites. He can't believe what he's saying. He can't control his donkey. He can't even control his mouth. And this is the amusing nature of God. He's using a soothsayer to accomplish his purposes. It's really interesting. Notice the first oracle. He took up his discourse and he said from his vantage point, looking down at the Israelites down below, he's got uh, you know, Balak, the king near him. From Aram Balak, he has brought me Moab's king from the mountains of the east. Come curse Jacob for me and come denounce Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed, the prophet says. And, and, and Balak's listening. Huh? And how can I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? I told you, I paying you to denounce him. Do it. I can't do it. As I see him from the top of the rocks, because I'm looking down below, and I look at him from the hills, the Israelites, behold, a people who dwells apart and will not be reckoned among the nations, who can count the dust of Jacob? 
or number the fourth part of Israel. Let me, as a prophet, die a death of the upright and let my end be like this. I can't curse him. Let me die first. You're Balak. What did you just, huh? I have paid you a ton of money to come from Mesopotamia to curse them. What is this? God was speaking through his mouth. Those are my people. Nothing's going to thwart the seed from coming. They're going to come through those people. Nothing will stop them. You know, that's the same true today. Nothing's going to stop Christ coming back to finish all that he prophesied to finish. He's even using the prophet that way. And then skip the next two oracles and we just close with the fourth oracle. Because two other times he gets different vantage points to try to curse him. And two other times, out comes blessing. It's totally humorous. Fourth oracle. He took up his fourth oracle. And he said, the oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is opened. The oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the most high God, who sees the vision of the almighty falling down, yet his eyes are uncovered. I see him. Sees who? I see him, but not now. Uh, I behold him, but, he's, but he's, he's not near. Who's he looking at? He says, well, I see. God's allowing me to see a star. Which when? Well, it's going to come from Jacob. Well, what kind of star? Well, a scepter uh, shall rise from Israel. He shall crush through the forehead of Moab, tear down the sons of Seth, wipe out Edom, etc., etc. He'll rule the world. This star that's coming from those Jews down below. You're paying him to curse him. And he, he's telling you, no, there's a star coming. And this star is going to be, whoa, a king. And he's going to rule the world. Who's the star? Christ. Christ. Uh, Kylan Dalich, the two greatest Hebrew scholars uh, uh, in the Old Testament, uh, I say this. In the star of Jacob, Balaam beholds not David uh, as the one king of Israel, but he sees the Messiah in whom the royalty of Israel is promised to the patriarchs. He attains its foolish realization. The star and the scepter are symbols not of Israel's royalty personified, but of the king, the real king in concrete form, as he who will rise out of Israel at the future day, the Messiah. Who's Jesus? Now think about this. Magi, where did the Magi come from that came to see Jesus after he was born? Where were they, where they, where were they from? Mesopotamia. Huh, interesting. Um, who was from there many, many years prior to the Magi? Balaam, who got a prophecy that the star's coming, the Messiah's coming. He's going to go back to the Mesopotamian region and tell all the soothsayers, I got a word from the living God who said a star is coming. He's going to rule the world. They knew this for hundreds of years. And then along comes Daniel, who winds up being head of the soothsayer class and teaches them about the star who's going to come. They follow that star all the way to Jesus. Amazing or the ways of God. Revelation twenty two sixteen 16 closes out the New Testament by calling Jesus the bright and morning star. That's the literal structure of the story. Spiritually, what does it tell us? A whole bunch of things. Number one, a donkey carried a false prophet. Later, a donkey is going to carry the true prophet, Jesus. Number two, a donkey saw Christ in the Old Testament it's so fitting for a donkey to see Christ born in the New Testament in a stable. Three, a donkey who carried around the prophet in the Old Testament had a low view of Israel. The other rider of the donkey in the New Testament, Christ, will have a high view of Israel as the people of God. Four, a false prophet was angry for all the wrong reasons. He was angry about money. No, the, the new prophet, Jesus, when he clears the temple, it's righteous anger over sin. Five, the presence of the donkey in both historical episodes illustrates how God goes to great lengths to wake up spiritual sleepers. Same thing Jesus does. Six, a donkey was probably around to, to hear the star and the scepter story in Numbers 24. So fitting for a donkey to be sitting there by the, the manger of Christ to go, oh yeah, yeah, there's the star, there's the scepter, there's the king. Lastly, the donkey shows us that God who can reveal himself to a little donkey, lowest common denominator of an animal, if he will reveal himself to a donkey, you are much more worth than a donkey. He shall reveal himself to you. May you embrace him as Messiah. Pray. God, we pause to pray and give you thanks for who you are. Oh, there's so much more we would want to say about this great passage and what it says about a little donkey.
Thank you for humbling yourself, becoming our Savior. Thank you for the little animals that surrounded your, your, your manger scene. Uh, because each one of them had a theological story to tell us if we but pay attention. And we give you praise and glory and, and worship you through our tithes and offerings now. The true star. Amen. God bless you.